Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. On the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, I love to answer your questions. If you have a question you think is going to be a broad interest, send it in. We'll answer it live on the air on one of our AMA episodes. That is, ask me anything. Send your questions to victor at victorjm.com. That's victor at victorjm.com. We are back. On today's show, we're talking about how to negotiate with your general contractor. Oftentimes, when a project is designed by an architect, there are design trade-offs that seem perfectly reasonable at the time. The design process consists of a complex puzzle of conflicting constraints of function, aesthetic, zoning constraints, building code, and cost. At the end of the process, you get a few hundred pages of detailed drawings and specifications. The general contractor will take the drawings and send them out for bid to multiple subcontractors and get multiple bids for each subtrade. When the results come back, how should you, as the project owner, respond to the general contractor? Most of the time, you're going to get summary data for each of the major divisions of work. You'll get a number for the site work. You'll have a bid for electrical, a bid for plumbing, another one for framing, and so on. It's probably going to be about 25 separate line items. So the question is, how do you decide if any of the numbers are acceptable? Even if the summary numbers match your budget, you may still have a problem. If the numbers are too high relative to your budget, well, you definitely have a problem. So how do you resolve it? You could try to negotiate with the GC, but in my estimation, that kind of arm twisting is a pretty blunt instrument. You may get a little bit of savings, but not much. In my experience, the problems in most construction budgets are the result of mismatches and assumptions. In some cases, design decisions have unintended consequences that if they were fully understood at the design time, they would have never been made. We were recently reviewing a construction budget for a project and were shocked to see $225,000 in expenses for outdoor electrical work on the site. Only by digging deeper, we were able to determine that the electrician had specified 25,000 linear feet of one-inch conduit on a site that measures 300 by 800. And then there was another 15,000 linear feet of three and four-inch conduit. Now, where on earth could you even begin to bury that much conduit on such a small site? Well, it turns out the one-inch conduit was being used for three purposes. Number one, to bring electrical power to lampposts that were scattered throughout the site. Number two, for internet and cable TV wiring. And number three, for signal wiring for access and security. By digging into the details, we were able to determine that by using building-mounted lighting, we could eliminate the lampposts. And by using optical fiber that's specified for outdoor underground placement, we could eliminate the need for the one-inch conduit almost entirely. The remainder of the outdoor electrical budget was made of three-inch and four-inch electrical conduit that buried the electrical wires beneath the ground for the transformers and for the buildings. This is an area that we could also further optimize. This whole process is called value engineering. By systematically digging into the details, the specifications with the general contractor and the architecture team, you can create major savings in a project. I'll give you another example. We had completed the site plan and everything was working, but when we looked at the routing of the utilities, we had far more pipe circulating around the property than necessary. This is because some of the buildings were too close together and the spacing was too narrow to allow for those utilities to be routed between the buildings. They had to be routed around the buildings at much higher cost. By making a minor change to the site plan, we were able to move the buildings apart and save a bunch of money on the underground utilities. We also noticed that when the buildings were close together, we had to use fire-rated windows on the walls that were close to the neighboring buildings. Fire-rated windows cost about double the price of regular windows. The end user can't tell the difference. The windows look the same. By moving the buildings apart, we were able to save 50% of the cost of the windows, in addition to the savings in the plumbing. Each one of these savings are not huge by themselves. In every case, we are able to save cost without sacrificing quality, or the value of the end product. The changes would be completely invisible to the end user of the property. After you've completed that exercise and saved as much money as you can on the scope of work, then it's time to negotiate with the contractor and save a few pennies more. As you're thinking about that, have an awesome rest of your day. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.